Jai Radha Bhagavan Kunja Bihari Yedhaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Gopi Janavalava Giri Paradhari Jaya Gopi Janavalava Giri Paradhari Jaya Giri Varadha Dya Sodanandana Brajadhyana Handhyanaya Dya Sodanandana Brajadhyana Handhyanaya Jammun Thira Havana Chahi Jammu Jammun Thira Havana Chahi Jammu Edhyai Radham Mahatva Kunja Bihari Jaya Edhyaya Ratham Mahatva Kunja Bihari Jaya Kunja Bihari Edhyaya Dhupi Janavalaba Giri Bhava Dhamma Hidhaya Dhupi Hidhaya Dhupi Janavallama Giri Bhava Dhamma Hidhaya Dhupi Hidhaya Sura Nandana Dhaja Dhana Handhaya Yasaur Nandana Praja Dhyana Hanja Jamun Thira Hivhan Chahadhyam Jamun Thira Hivhan Chahadhyam Jai Radham Mahatva Kunja Bihari Kunja Bihari Jai Radham Mahatva Kunja Bihari Jai Pancha Tadva Pancha Tadva, Pancha Tadva, Pancha Tadva, Jaya Gauranitai, 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 Jaya Gauranitai, Prabhu Pa, Prabhu Pa, Prabhu Pa, Jaya Prabhu Pa, Prabhu Pa, Jaya Jaya Prabhu Pa, Shila Prabhu Pa, Ki Jaya, Harinam Shankirtan Ki Jaya.
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So today we're beginning chapter 2 <coughs> titled The Elephant Gajendra's Crisis but there was one unfinished verse from the previous chapter, so I'll just read the translation. And this is the, the last verse in it. Sri Sukha Goswami said, O Brahmana, when Maharaj Parikshit, who was sitting impending death, awaiting impending death, thus requested Sukadev Goswami to speak, Sukadev Goswami, encouraged by the king's words, offered respect to the king and spoke with great pleasure in the assembly of sages who desired to hear them. This is a real verse on the principle of culture and etiquette, Vaishnava etiquette. Move on to the first verse of the next chapter. Sri Sukha Uvacha Asangiri Varo Rajams Sri Kuta Iti Vishrutahu Sritaha Shiro Denna Vritam Sriman Yojayan Yutam Uchritaha Sri Sukhu Uvacha Asit giri varo rajams Trikuta iti vishrutahataha Shiro denna vritam sriman Yojana yutam utstritaha Sri sukha uvacha Asit giri varo rajams Trikuta iti vishrutaha Shiro denna vritam sriman Yojana yutam utsritaha Ladies, Sri Sukha Uvacha. <coughs> Sri Sukha Dev Goswami said, Asit, there was, Girivara, a very big mountain, Rajan, O King, Trikutaha, 
Trikutaha. Iti, thus, Visrutaha, celebrated. Shira Udena, by the ocean of milk. Avrata, surrounded. Sriman, very beautiful. Yojana, a measurement of eight miles. Ayutam, 10,000. Utsritaha, very high. Translation, Sukadev Goswami said, speaking to Maharaj Pariksit, my dear king, there's a very large mountain called Trikuta. It has 10,000, it is 10,000 yojanas, that is 80,000 miles high, being surrounded by the ocean of milk, and it is very beautifully situated. So we're talking about something in the higher realms now. Uh, verses 2 and 3, translation. The length and breadth of the mountain are of the same measurement, 80,000 miles. Its three principal peaks, which are made of iron, silver, and gold, beautifully beautify all directions and the sky. The mountain also has other peaks, which are full of jewels and minerals, and is decorated with nice trees, creepers, and shrubs. The sounds of the waterfalls on the mountain create a very pleasing vibration. In this way, the mountain stands, increasing the beauty in, of all directions. Text number four. The ground at the foot of the mountain is always washed by waves of milk that produce emeralds all around in three directions. North, south, east, west, and a direction midway between them. Oh, I'm sorry, in all around in eight directions. North, south, east, west, and the directions midway between them. That means the four corners. Srila Prabhupada's purport. From Srimad Bhagavatam, we understand that there are various oceans. Somewhere there is an ocean filled with milk, somewhere an ocean of liquor, an ocean of ghee, an ocean of oil, an ocean of sweet water. Thus, there are various varieties of oceans within the universe. The modern scientists, who only have limited experience, cannot defy these statements. They cannot give us full information about any planet, even the planet on which we live on. From this verse, however, we can understand that if the valleys of some mountains are washed with milk, this produces emeralds. No one has the ability to imitate the activities of material nature as conducted by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri gurvena maha shri chaitanya manobhistam stapitam yena bhutale swayam rupa kidam mayam dadati swapadantikam nama om vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shri bhakti bhakti vedanta swami ti namane namaste saraswati deve gaurvani pacharine Nirvasesa sunyavari pastyatya de satarine Panchakalpa through his chakripa sindhu vevacha patitanam pavane bio vaishnave bio namaho namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasari Gaur Bhaktavrind Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Mm. So we are hearing about some beautiful scenery in the higher realms of existence, in the heavenly realms. And this is uh, Trikuta Mountain. Tree means three and Kuta means peak. So there are three peaks. One is made out of iron, one is made out of silver and one is made out of gold. And this mountain is the beautiful spot in the heavenly realm. And it's, it's a place for the demigods to go and they perform many of their pastimes there. Um, so it is, uh, we're getting a little insight of something that is uh, 
uh, beyond our purview of the experience. Now here, Prabhupada wants to make a point, and this point is very instructive, you know. We have a tendency to hear from the leaders in today's society, the scientists, the medical professionals, the, you know, politicians, and so many things. But we see, and especially in this verse, that Prabhupada wants to make it clear that they don't know anything, <laughs> to put it really clearly. They are simply using imperfect senses with imperfect instruments created by imperfect senses to try to understand something beyond the range of the senses. And therefore, whatever they say is speculation at best. Yeah, uh, we had an example, at least I had an experience. I came across an article in which it said uh, that it was describing a certain cosmological cosmological arrangement in the heavenly realm. And so this uh, arrangement was accepted and studied and uh, written in books by scientists for 35 years. It was considered to be truth and all the scientists seemed to validate this. But then an experiment was done based on this cosmological arrangement and based on what Einstein had said previously, that there, what you see is not where it is. <laughs> it's called refracted light. That light refracts or reflects a object in one place, and you see it in one place, but it's millions of miles from where you actually see it. <laughs> in other words, the light gives the indication it's there, but it's not. It's actually just, just a reflection. I use the word refraction. And so after coming to the conclusion based on this second experiment that was done, taking Einstein's uh, understanding, they took 35 years of research and threw it out, <laughs> saying, we were wrong, give us a chance, we'll try again. <laughs> so this is today's uh, scientific, I mean, this is just one of many, and you read the fifth canto, it says that the the moon is 1,600,000 miles farther away than the sun from the earth. So we accept that the moon is closer to the earth because the scientists said so. <laughs> so all their scientific, you know, knowledge or so-called knowledge is based on speculation <laughs> at best. And as we mentioned, they have no way to understand things beyond the senses. But everyone accepts them because they are scientists. <laughs> and therefore, nobody knows anything. We're misled by all these. Therefore, you have to go to authority. That authority that is not within the range of the four defects, with four illusion, Imperfect senses, cheating propensity, and what's the other one? Huh? Makes mistakes. <laughs> so actually, it actually falls into a pattern. Because you have imperfect senses, you become illusioned. And because you become illusioned, you make mistakes. In order to cover your mistakes, you use the cheating propensity. So you see how these four actually follow in the sequence. Well, that's today's knowledge that you get in, in books. So we go to school and Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, you come out a fool. You don't learn anything. In fact, you learn the wrong things. Or the, and therefore, you, you know, nobody has any knowledge. Even, as Prabhupada said, even they can't even give us the knowledge of what's happening on this planet. What to speak of the knowledge. So, but we take Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is the literary representation of Krishna given by his pure devotee, Vyasadeva. Vyasadeva is not just a pure devotee, he is an incarnation, Shaktivesh incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, 
meant to deliver transcendental knowledge to the world in the form of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And so he, he's not under the influence of these four defects. And he's taking what has already been given in the, in the Vedas. He, he takes the Vedanta Sutra. From the Vedanta Sutras you get the Brahma Sutras. And from the Brahma Sutras you get Srimad Bhagavatam. And Bhagavatam is the condensed version of all these other knowledges and then expanded on by another pure devotee, Srila Prabhupada, you get truth, you get understanding. And that is how knowledge is understood. There are different categories of how knowledge is acquired. There's three basic ones. One is called Prayaksha, Anumanta, and Sabda. <laughs> these are the three categories of knowledge. They use... Um, Prayaksha, which means empirical observation using you know, various types of instruments which they've created with their imperfect senses to give you perfect knowledge. And then you have uh, hypothesis, which is anumanta, which is historical references. And then the third and most solid form of Knowledge is called sabda, or transcendental knowledge. Sabda means sound. Transcendental sound vibration that comes through the pure disciplic succession. In other words, persons who have no, motiva mo no motivation to try to dupe the public for some economic or some you know, political reasons. They simply are giving that knowledge as coming from Krishna himself, because Krishna is the source of knowledge. He's called Adi Guru. He is the original. So Srimad Bhagavatam, it always sounds fantastic, because you hear about some of the things in Srimad Bhagavatam, you think, wow, you know, Lord Brahma, he has one million heads. Where does he place it all? I mean, how big is that body? <laughs> So you might think, well, you know, that's nice. It gives you, it gives you an exciting reading, but it's not really the way it is. But that because is our senses and our experiences are very limited. I'll give you an example. An example is two ants are walking along, two little ants on the floor. And one ant says to the other ant, you know, I think there's something up there. And the other ant says, no, nah, no, nah, you just had too much sugar. You know, it's, you, you're intoxicated. There's nothing up there. So the ants can't really understand our world. And even other species of life below, they can't understand our world. And sometimes they can't even perceive that we exist within that world. But we do. We know that. And so you take that same principle and apply it. There are higher and higher realms of existence that we have no knowledge of. So where do we get this knowledge from? We get it from the perfect source, Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is the manifestation of Krishna in sound vibration given by you know, Vyasadeva. It's pure. So therefore, in order to understand real knowledge, you have to hear from authority. Prabhupada was, when he was in Russia, he was talking with Professor Katovsky. Prabhupada always talks about this dialogue he had. He liked Professor Katovsky, and Professor Katovsky liked Prabhupada. This was during the communist time, the strict communist time in Russia. And uh, they were the talking about different things. Of course, Prabhupada disagreed with a lot what he said. But he also appreciated the Vedic knowledge and was giving much credit to Srila Prabhupada and, and the work he was doing. And then, but Professor Kostovsky was giving his theory and Prabhupada was giving his understanding. But he said, basically, there's no difference between what I'm saying and what you're saying. Not in content, but in how the knowledge is received. You accept Lenin, we accept Krishna. In other words, everyone has to accept an authority. Otherwise, we're, otherwise mental speculation is what it is. It just leads on and on to more and more ideas that are always changing. Mm -hmm. 
So Prabhupada using that understanding is this is how we understand knowledge. We take it from higher authority. Yeah. And when that higher authority is free from the four defects and is coming from the highest source, the Supreme Lord himself, then we can say whatever we hear, we can say this is truth, this is reality. Mm -hmm. Like we have no understanding of what it's like in the spiritual world. And we hear about the spiritual world, especially in Srimad Bhagavatam in the 10th canto. Also in the 3rd canto they describe Vaikuntha in detail. But we've never been there. We never, I mean, we hear from others. So, so we can accept it based on the fact that it's coming from authority. But then again, when you start to investigate some of the things that are being said, <coughs> all you can do is accept it. <coughs> you can't understand it because there's no reference to it. Our reference is what's going on in our life and what we hear from, from people on this level. That's our only references. Or maybe the references of people who have done it come from the past. But otherwise, all we can do is accept it. Therefore, Jiva Goswami makes a very strong point. And this, this principle allows us to understand the nature of God. What is that principle? That, that Krishna is a chintya. And the knowledge about Krishna is a chintya also. It's inconceivable. That's why we say a chintya beta beta tattva. That something, knowledge is not only one and different, but it's also inconceivably one and different. But how do you know it? Can you actually know it through your own mind and senses and intelligence? The answer is yes, you can. You can know it, but not through using your mind and senses and intelligence to understand it. That's not the process. You know it through the process of bhakti. As you make advancement in Krishna consciousness, this knowledge becomes revealed to you through the quality of your devotion. And when you become a pure devotee, you know everything. <laughs> It's not a matter of, well, you know, I have to figure it out. No, it's, that knowledge is there because by nature the soul is what? Chit. It's chit. It means the soul knows everything, past, present, and future. So as we uncover that knowledge through the process of bhakti, it becomes revealed. And that knowledge is called intuitive. You know it's true. Nobody has... you. Nobody has to tell you it's not true, and nobody has to prove to you it's true. You know it. Just like we use an example. This is an example. If you're eating, <coughs> nobody has to tell you when you are satisfied. You know it by the experience of eating itself. You get to the point, you say, oh, I'm satisfied, that's all. So that's an experience. And someone else will say, well, eat more. Well, I'm satisfied. No, no, eat more. no, no. They don't understand your experience because it's only your experience. So in the same way, this is how transcendental knowledge is delivered to us through the process of bhakti. It becomes awakened, realized knowledge by Krishna's mercy when Krishna is pleased by our devotional service. And that is called, that is called special mercy. Sometimes people say, well, what is special mercy? That means that mercy that is given directly by the Lord or the pure body that gives you realizations on the knowledge that you are uh, reading about, hearing about like that. We, want, we have to go to that stage, otherwise our bhakti is incomplete. We have to go to the stage of realizing we are a pure soul and that this knowledge is transcendental and it brings our consciousness into the spiritual realm. If we re remain on the theoretical platform simply reading books and learning what's in the books but we don't understand them, that's a certain level of bhakti but it doesn't satisfy because unless it comes to the stage of realization which is the process of bhakti then we uh, we remain somewhat uh, less purified, you might say. 
So how do you how do you realize knowledge? You practice it. You take the knowledge and you apply it. Everything we learn in terms of how we do things and what is the consciousness in what we do things with and the activity itself, all of these things together, have to be part of a regular waking consciousness. Hmm. You've heard of the word spaced out? <laughs> you know what spaced out is. That means there's some space that is needs to be filled. <laughs> So we used, we used to use that word in when somebody was like, appear to be there, but they're not there. <laughs> Their mind is somewhere else or it's nowhere, you know. Daydreaming or just unconscious. So spaced out means that you have to bring that space back in by becoming conscious of everything you do at every moment. <laughs> at every moment. That's Krishna conscious. There's no room for like a gap in mental activity. <laughs> because as as you stay fixed in keeping your consciousness connected to the spiritual process, that consciousness is, de is developing. Each time you deviate that consciousness away, that consciousness stops its development. It may also go backwards if you leave it long enough alone. Therefore, one has to constantly be connected to the process. And that can e that's easy to be done. All you have to do is remember Krishna or remember devotional service. Even if you're not actively participating in uh, some kind of service, if you're remembering Krishna or remembering, if you're remembering a verse in the scriptures, if you're thinking about how to serve these are all ways of keeping yourself connected to the spiritual energy. Because everything about devotional service is transcendental. And that way we can build our consciousness up. So there's no gap. Sometimes people think, well, I need a break. I just got a, I didn't get a letter, but I found out through another person that one of my disciples, she said, well, I need a break. <laughs> and I'll take, I'll be back. <laughs> but that doesn't work, because each time you take a break, when you come back, it's harder. <laughs> I remember when I was in New Vrindavan, there was this one devotee. He would go for some time, and then he would try his best, and then he'd leave, he'd come back. He'd come back, and then he'd try again. And then after some time, he would leave, and he'd come back. But each time he came back, he stayed less, less each time. And then finally, he didn't come back at all. Yeah. So stay in the fire. Sometimes it burns. <laughs> what is that burning, that that desire to keep our material attachments and still perform devotional service. Krishna is purifying us, so that's why sometimes we say, well, I'm fried. <laughs> fried means I'm not willing to surrender anymore. That's what it really means. <laughs> Krishna's pulling and I'm pulling the other way. <laughs> and there, there's the fry process. <laughs> But stay in it, even if it burns a little, or it's a little uncomfortable, you're actually becoming purified. Stay When we stay in the process of Krishna consciousness, we are making, a, we are making progress, even if we don't experience a, a tangible understanding of how that progress is being made, we are making progress. Stay in the fire of devotion. That's why it's 24-7. It's not something that you just can put on hold, just like the summer months. Oh, yes, the summer months, and we have the mountains, and we have the shores, and we need a little break, going some swimming and practicing how to become fish in my next life, you know. <laughs> yeah, so taking a break really means, um, you know, going backwards in Krishna. Stay, if you stay in the fire of Krishna consciousness, you'll find that your progress at one point becomes very rapid. 
you'll see that I experience that all of a sudden you make a lot of advancement. It's like you're trying, you're trying, and you're trying, and you're trying, and all of a sudden it kind of like breaks, and, and it just goes. Because Krishna is just rewarding your efforts in devotional service. Like that. So this is Krishna consciousness here. So back to the the essential things that here we're hearing about the higher planets and we're hearing about something that is way beyond our understanding based on our experiences. But we can accept it because it's coming from the perfect authority. And that is the principle of how bhakti works. Accepting the perfect authority, trying to understand the knowledge they are giving and the practical <laughs> advice they give, and also understanding how to apply it in your life. And that is the whole process of devotional service. From that comes realization. From realization comes the, mm, the qualities and characteristics that we develop in devotional service. We develop transcendental qualities. Then devotional service is no longer theoretical or just something that is there and we're here and there it is. We actually become part of it. It becomes, it's no longer separate from you. You live within that energy of devotional service. It becomes, you become it. And, then, and therefore you're not touched by this material energy in no sense of the term. So we can stay. In, in. So that is the process here. So accepting the knowledge coming from higher authority. That's the most important part here. Yeah. So therefore we should read and hear regularly Srimad Bhagavad Nasta Prayesha Abhidresha Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhakavati Uttama Sloki Bhakti Bhavati Naistaki that it's not optional. Bhagavatam has to be read and 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 there's like, we were hearing just the other day from Pure Krishna Maharaj when he was saying, pointing out one devotee in America, Vaisheshika. He's the king of book distribution in the world, practically. And uh, he reads uh, 41 pages of Srimad Bhagavatam every day. Because his whole idea is to finish Bhagavatam in one year. So they divided, they counted the pages, divided it into 365 days. Comes to 41 pages of Bhagavatam every day. And so that's, that's a vow he's made. So we can also make vows, how much we can read every day, how much we can chant every day. That connects us nicely to the process of devotional service and gives us a sense of responsibility in Krishna consciousness. If you want to make advancement in Krishna consciousness, there's one word that really is very important. It's called responsibility. You have to be responsible for taking part in the activities of devotional service in a committed way. If we feel good, and then we do it because we feel good, and if we don't feel good, we'll decide, well, I'll wait till I feel good again. And then that's the material world. Everything is based on feeling. Feel good or don't feel good, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Stay in that energy because it will after a while feel good <laughs> continuously. We have to go through that process of purification. So stay fixed in devotional service. I remember when we were brahmacharis, we were given that that instruction. Somehow, 24 hours a day, stay busy in Krishna consciousness. Of course, in those days, we didn't spend so much time reading and studying. It was more emphasis on doing. Because we had, I was at Nuvrindavan, we had a huge project. And so Prabhupada was encouraging the leadership to build the Nuvrindavan, you know, more and more and more. And so projects were coming up and uh, more and more N uh, manpower was needed to fill those projects. So we were working mostly t like, you know, 24-7. <laughs> Even through the night, we were doing construction right through the night. I mean, really. We had bulldozers and cranes and various other heavy equipment, you know, excavating land, building buildings. It was going on through the night. <laughs> it was 24-7. Not all the devotees were doing that, but some were. 
Well, that was that was the that was the and that was the mood. Everybody was somehow or other engaged in some kind of activity to help Bill Milburn down. So, and of course we could have spent more time reading and chanting, but we also would go to our Bhagavatam classes and then the Bhagavad Gita in the evenings like that. But um, we were taught, don't break for a second. <laughs> Stay in the fire of Krishna consciousness. Hearing, chanting, serving, keep that mood going and then you'll taste the happiness of Krishna consciousness. That's how you taste it when you stay in that fire, because that fire is purifying. It brings our consciousness back to the lotus feet of the Krishna in devotion. Okay, and Srimad Bhagavatam is the direction given to us, the authoritative direction by which we can do everything in a proper way and understand what is that, what is the philosophy that governs all the activities we perform, because everything we do can be explained in a philosophical way. It's all there in scripture. Okay, so any questions? Comments? Mm -hmm. Hari? Mm -hmm. Hari Krishna. Uh, would you uh, be able to kindly uh, remember somebody who uh, got a realization by practicing and then getting more and more revelation through the practice of some, um, some of the things that we read? Uh, yeah, me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, one day I was I was with Giriraj Swami in California, but I wasn't with him at the, personally. I was just w with his place, and I had just finished breakfast, and I was chanting, and all of a sudden, I got this real strong realization. It wasn't like a theoretical thing. I am not this body. Pow! Boom! It became clear. It was not just like, whoa, you know. Uh, you know, we hear about it. We're not this body. We read about it. They tell them, everybody tells. But when you actually realize it through an experience, that that's the intuitive knowledge that comes by way of Krishna's mercy. That knowledge is causeless. You can't produce it. You can't make it come. It comes by way of But when you get it, then you get that realization. That you, when you realize that that Srila Prabhupada is pretty much a manifestation of Lord Nityananda in person, he is actually Lord Nityananda in person, Srila Prabhupada. That's another realization I got. That he's coming because Lord Nityananda is the supreme manifestation of the personality of Guru who comes to give unlimited mercy in the form of gu guiding the conditioned souls back to Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So we get realizations occasionally. I'm sure you had realizations. Every one of us has some level of realization on something. Just like we have our Uddhava Mitra here. He just like distributes books like people, you know, collect you know, stamps or something. He's, it's, not, it's natural for him to r distribute books. It's like, so, but it's like the realizations you get when you're distributing books is it's not you that's doing it. It's that somehow you're an instrument and you can experience Krishna working through you to, t to tell that person, say, yes, I'll take the book. Book distribution gives you a lot of realizations on how this philosophy and the practice works. It's really one of the more powerful services to get that realization. Because, you know, people come out of the house and never, they're not kind of thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a book on Hare Krishna today. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and somehow it happens, you know. 
and maybe they're not even interested. But the book distributor, distributor is carrying Krishna's mercy with him, and so all of a sudden it happens. <laughs> and I've I've met people who said, "Yeah, I don't know why I'm buying this book, but I'm buying it." <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like that. So yeah, we get realizations on how we are simply instruments for, you know, the Lord, for the pure devotee. We're not somehow just doing things by our own volition. That's a realization many of us get like that. Mm. Like, you know, you give a class sometime and you think, Wow, that wasn't so good. And everybody comes up and says, wow, what a great class, you know. And then you give another class and you think, that was pretty good. And everybody kind of doesn't even look at you, you know. <laughs> when you start to analyze yourself as being the doer, you realize it's not like that. <laughs> it's coming through another energy. Is that okay? Does that help a little bit? Yeah. So this project, is, if you, if you want to, if you really want magic in your life, stay in Krishna consciousness. It's a, it's really magical. <laughs> it it defies all normal laws of material energy. The most amazing things happen. I mean, I could tell hundreds of stories. It's like the one story that I always tell. Maybe you heard it before. Devotees in the Philadelphia Temple in Pennsylvania, one of the main temples at the time, uh, the, the the rent was due two hundred and fifty dollars, and they had they didn't have any money. They had spent everything on other things. The rent was due the next day. Many days in those days, we a lot of the buildings that we had for temples we rented them. So it was a two hundred and fifty dollar rent. So the temple president said, well. Let's all go out on hiring now. I'm not going to worry about the rent. So he took the whole temple out except for the pujaris on Harinam. So while they're out on Harinam, they're chanting and dancing. And one very nicely dressed man, he comes up to one of the ladies who's out there. And he smiled on his face. He hands her an envelope and says, thank you very much for what you're doing. This is so nice. And then he turns around and leaves. Nobody sees him again. She opens the envelope, $250. <laughs> I mean, there's so many stories. You know? If you were able to be with Prabhupada, you would watch how Prabhupada would just like, it's like he wasn't even part of this world, how he did things. You, know? you would watch him and he'd think, is he, is he here or is he coming from another realm? I mean, he's, Prabhupada, the way he conducted his behavior, his speech, and his activities, it was completely mag magical. Just watching him was just like, whoa. He, this person's not part of this world at all. No, no. Well, that's Krishna consciousness. But you have to stay in the fire to experience it. If you stay in, stay in Krishna consciousness, no matter how difficult it is, you'll always be, uh, at some time, you'll always feel that, yes, I'm making advancement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, realizations, devotees get them all the time. <laughs> Sometimes very amazing realizations, and sometimes just kind of like day-to-day -day stuff that we just like to learn that you're not to to feel that you're not this body. That's an that's an ordinary realization. It's not something. Hmm. But Prabhupada would do something that devotees couldn't figure out why he was doing what he was doing. You know, it seemed like very impractical. But then. If they, when they did it, they saw what Prabhupada was saying was right. Because Prabhupada could see, understand things that we couldn't see or even understand. 
That's a transcendental consciousness. And so we also get that too, I mean, yeah, to some degree. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, Urugai, thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Maharaj, uh, can you please uh, explain um, what is the actual difference between uh, knowledge and uh, realized knowledge? Is it like uh, uh, when we realize that we believe it as as we believe in in uh, our satisfied uh, stomach after eating or... Uh, yeah, it's the difference between reading the menu. Somebody might tell you what's, what's for lunch and that gets you interested in taking lunch. But the experience is different. So that's the difference between theoretical knowledge and Realized knowledge. Realized knowledge isn't a, is an experience. Just like e- becoming satisfied from eating is an experience. There's a, ver- there's a verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the eleventh canto, second chapter. I think it's verse number no eleven five twenty one or twenty two something like that. By devotional service, uh, just like when you eat. You get happiness, satisfaction, and freedom from hunger. So by devotional service, you free yourself from material suffering. You get uh, knowledge of Krishna. And you get uh, one one more thing. Detachment, yeah. Yeah. So that, that analogy of consuming food is helps us to really understand a little bit about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you get realizations, but realizations are not enough to keep you in Krishna consciousness. What keeps you c- fixed in Krishna consciousness is being fixed in the knowledge. You can dance in ecstasy and you can even fly up and hit the ceiling when you're in kirtan and you know you're you're rolling on the ground and you're feeling all kinds of ecstatic symptoms. The next day you might be, you know, at the beach having a pizza party, you know. So the, these these ecstasies or experiences of happiness in Krishna consciousness, they sort of validify the process, but they don't keep you, f- they're not enough to keep you s- engaged in devotional service. What keeps you engaged is that you have to have an understanding on the philosophical platform. In other words, you have to act out of knowledge and not simply out of experience. Experiences come and go. Knowledge is, is you know, knowledge builds itself more and more. And the Bhagavad Gita says when you have complete knowledge, then even in the most dangerous situation, you're not disturbed. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, look at Prahlad Maharaj, you know. He was f- completely fixed on Krishna. Nothing could disturb him. So that, that that's available for everyone because it's the same Krishna and it's the same process. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but my point is, develop that knowledge that keeps you fixed in devotional service. You have to have that knowledge. We call it Shastra Chakshus. Seeing through knowledge, seeing through scripture. (laughs) How you feel, it doesn't matter how you feel. (laughs) Feelings come and go. I love you, but today I don't love you. (laughs) You know, we we have experiences with people in the world. We have different experiences feelings that come and go with these relationships. <laughs> People get in before marriage, oh, we'll be together for life. And after one year, I've had it, I quit. <laughs> <It's like laughs> so feel, feelings come and go, you know, it's just, just the way it is. <laughs> 
stay fixed on knowledge and then, then you're fixed in the process. Mm -hmm. And you'll get experiences too based on that, that remaining fixed in knowledge. Mm -hmm. Knowledge means what is my duty in Krishna consciousness? I have to chant my rounds. It doesn't mean what I feel like or whether it's easy. Like today, my rounds were a little difficult, but I was thinking, it's Krishna, it's the holy name, doesn't matter, still got a chant. Sometimes they're easy, sometimes they're not, sometimes whatever reason, doesn't matter, just keep chanting. <laughs> Does that help? Okay, any questions? Any other questions or comments? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.